Hello. Uh, probably we can start. I hope you can uh, hear me and you can see me. OK. Uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to RCI POD webinar on migrant workers and remittances in a time of pandemic. Uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic continued to spread, af affecting health systems and economies around the globe. Uh, I checked WHO website yesterday. As of uh, yesterday, uh, 3rd of uh, August, there are almost uh, 18 million uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 in over 187 countries, and more than uh, 680,000 lives have been lost. Aside from this heavy human toll, the pandemic is also creating one of the deepest recession in the world in the last uh, 150 years, with global growth expected to decline by over 5% in 2020. In our recent analysis, the employment effects from the pandemic are also severe. Globally, employment value equivalent to 158 million to 242 million jobs will be lost in two scenarios, a three months containment versus six months containment necessary. We have uh, examined equivalent to 6.0% to 9.2% of total global employment. So employment losses are uh, going to be enormous. For Asia, the dropping employment will reach 109 million to 167 million or 60 nine percent of total employment losses globally this estimated impact is more than seven times the drop in employment during 2008 2009 global financial crisis uh, which reduced employment by about 22 million people measured as full-time job equivalent expectedly migrant workers will be among the hardest hit among the groups. They are directly affected by uh, broader control restrictions, as have limited job security and protection. Migrants from Asia and the Pacific accounted for 33% or 91 million of 272 million migrant workers worldwide in year 2019. Major destination regions for Asian migrants include Asia, 35%, Middle East, 27%. Europe, including the uh, uh, inclusive of the Russian Federation, 19%. And North America, 18%. These are the major destination of Asian migrants. All of these regions have been devastated by the economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, with economic output in these economies projected to contract by 6.7% to 10.2% uh, this year, year to 2020. And uh, this is what we will discuss today. Uh, the order of magnitude of COVID-19 impact on migration and remittances and policy options that are critical to manage the effect this will bring to migrants and their families. And we have a lineup of distinguished speakers. So let me open this uh, webinar formally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'd like to invite um, uh, Aiko Kikawa Takenaka uh, uh, from uh, ADB ERCD and also James uh, Bira uh, Ferte uh, of uh, ERCD ADB. So let me um, uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, these two uh, speakers. Uh, Aiko, uh, Aiko Kikawa Takenaka is an economist at Economic Research and Cooperation uh, uh, department uh, ERCD of Asian Development Bank ADB. She covers research topic of aging and demographic changes, international migration and remittances, and economic analysis of ADB projects. Prior to joining ADB, she was with International Organization for Mi Migration, IOM, where she led technical assistance programs on migration and overseas employment policy, remittances, and disaster relief operation targeting mobile uh, po population in multiple countries of Asia and Europe. Um, who is joining uh, Aiko is um, uh, James uh, Biraferte. Uh, he, he's a senior economist at uh, ERCD, the same um, uh, 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 department of ADB, and um, um, he is uh, engaging in regional cooperation integration. Um, prior to joining ADP, uh, James 
uh, worked as a team leader of Asian Regional Integration Center at the ADB, uh, senior economist at the Department of Treasury in Finance in Melbourne, Australia, and economist at the uh, Poverty Reduction and Economic Management Team at the World Bank Office in Manila. So with that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Aiko and James for initial presentation, which will set the stage. And um, uh, Aiko and James, you can spend uh, 20, 25 minutes for uh, uh, initial presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to hand over my phone to Aiko and uh, James. Thank you very much, Chief Economist. This is a joint presentation with myself and James, and I would start uh, first. As we're all aware, the COVID pandemics continue to weigh quite heavily on the economic system and its effect on employment, as shown uh, as uh, discussed in the introduction opening of this uh, chief economist, is quite staggering. Uh, our earlier estimate shows that the billions, uh, billions of dollars were lost in the, in the form of wage loss in Asia and the Pacific alone. The international migrant tends to, be, tends to have a less job security and also a bargaining power, and it's uh, considered among the hardest hit. Uh, moreover, the negative shock on their job and also on income transcend the border to affect the source economy and also the well-beings of the family back home who counts on remittances. Next slide, please. Therefore, in the uh, policy brief number 148 released yesterday, myself and uh, James uh, have uh, discussed the impact, comprehensive impact on COVID-19 on migration and the migrant workers' job and on the remittances. And here are the four key messages. There are over a 91 million international migrants from Asia and the Pacific, and majority are workers employed in foreign destinations. Their job security is under great threat, although the impact may vary by the host economy and the sectors. Our estimate, as we present, suggests that remittance inflow to Asia and the Pacific is to drop by 11.5% at the baseline scenario, or up to 19.8% at the worst case scenario relative to pre-COVID baseline. The drop in remittances is likely to hurt migrant uh, source countries, which are dependent on remittances. And that the, those that are highly dependent on remittances as an economy or as a household include those in Pacific and West, uh, Central and West Asia. As a policy responses, host and source countries are encouraged to offer and continue to offer temporary and long term assistance to affected and distressed migrant, as well as the low income remittance recipient household. And as a part of that effort, continuity of remittance services and providing a supportive uh, business environment remains critical. Next, please. So as shown in the figure left, uh, already presented by uh, Chief Economist, the international migrant originating from Asian Pacific, shown in the red, uh, counts about the third of a total stock of global migrants that are uh, volumes about 272 million. And this is for the pre-COVID stock at the point of 2019. And the major destination include Asia itself, Middle East, Europe, Russian Fed uh, Europe, including Russia, and also North America. And the remittance to Asia Pacific, showing on the right chart, amount to about 315 billion in the last year. As you see in the red figure, Remittance inflow are important, stable, and also expanding source of income for many countries in the region, which helps strengthen external financing. The remittance inflow in red, far, you can see that it's far outweighed that of ODA showing in green, and also closely for the photos, a growing inflow that comes from tourism receipts shown in the gray line. In general, we all know that remittance flows are considered counter cyclical because migrants tend to send more funds to their family during the period of economic shock, for example, during the natural disasters. However, in the COVID-19 situation, it might bring different scenario. As we all know, the pandemic is simultaneously hurting uh, both the host 
and the source countries of migrant. Next, please. The migrant workers as a, in, the, in the labor market are seen disproportionately affected by pandemic. In the US, for example, the unemployment rate among foreign born have surged at higher margin than natives, and the gap remains wide. In Europe, where non-EU nationals are already in a disadvantaged uh, employment status, the pandemic has exacerbated that gap. The non-EU workers saw their employment rate rise, steeper in countries such as Sweden, 6% up, Austria, 3.4% up, and others. At more granular level, the extent of shock to migrant job depends on the sector in which migrants are employed, as well as the overall economic conditions of host countries. The hard hit sectors include leisure and hospitality, and others uh, that employs a large number of migrants. Other hard hit sector include retail and wholesale, manufacturing, accommodation and food, food service. Meanwhile, newly recruit, recruited migrants are another hidden victim. The deployment of new batch of workers are being suspended in many countries due to travel restrictions. Although some countries such as the Philippines continue to allow out migration under some conditions, the travel restriction has serious consequences for migration from those who are about to go to work abroad. And this applies to, uh, in particular, migrants from Central and West Asia that includes large seasonal and temporary migration, primarily to Russia. Next, please. The official central, central bank data on monthly remittance inflow already shows a significant decline during the first six months of this year in many countries, but there are some variations in the magnitude and consistency as you see on this figure. The large drop is observed in Central and West Asia, Kazakhstan minus 33.5%, uh, Kyrgyz Republic 25% down, Almania 17% down as year to date uh, comparison. A more moderate decline is observed for uh, Pacific such as Fiji and Samoa. And some variation exists for South Asian countries with countries like Sri Lanka experiencing a drop of 11.9%, whereas a total of 9.3 increase uh, year to date uh, experienced in recorded in Pakistan. You would also note the relative, uh, like some, some spike in the last column showing in a gray for countries such as Bangladesh or Pakistan. This is partly uh, attributed or seemingly attributed to the um, lifting of some lockdown measures in destination country. So this has finally allowed the workers to go and remit over the counters. And also it is also reported that the introduction of some policy measures that incentivize the workers abroad or immigrants abroad to transfer by reducing uh, transaction fees or some restriction on the maximum amount they can remit has also contributed to some uh, surge in the recent month. I now hand over to James for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, thank Yasu, and, and thank you, Aiko. And good morning, everyone. Uh, let me now go into the impact assessment uh, for the COVID-19 uh, impact on remittances, which was implemented using the Global Migration Model or GMIG2 model. The data we used for uh, this uh, simulation, uh, the first one is the GTAP 10A database, which was also supplemented by migration stock data from the UN and the bilateral migration flow data from the Global Knowledge Partnership Migration and Development. Uh, let me just quickly describe the GMIG model which was used in this uh, simulation. So the GMIG model basically assumes that there is a global labor market pool and that this global labor market pool allows the modeling of bilateral migration. So in, in simple terms, migrants basically respond, respond to the wage differential that are observed between the home country of the migrant as well as the destination country. 
so in if you look at the wage of the migrant workers it will be uh, the wage in the home country plus a proportion of the wage differential between the host and the source uh, country uh, remittance is basically treated as a fixed input for uh, of income by the migrant workers so it is a fixed proportion beta in the model and basically uh, what we did with this GMIG model is we implemented an endogenous shock on migration where migration basically responds to uh, the differential in the wage uh, in GMIG. And in turn, the wage differential is also influenced by uh, the GDP impact of COVID on these economies. We assume that the change in the growth of GDP is uh, what's driving the change in the wage growth. So this is the table for the baseline scenario. So in, in the analysis, we conducted two scenarios, the baseline scenario, uh, which is actually consistent with the long containment scenario uh, reported in ADB briefs uh, number 133. So in the sixth month, in the long containment scenario, we assume that it takes roughly around six months to control the pandemic and normalize economic situation and that there is uh, a dissipation of the impact in the last three months. So there's a return halfway to, to normalization in the last three months. Uh, the other scenario that we analyzed is actually the worst case scenario, where we assume that the pandemic control and normalization of economic activities last for around roughly a year, with again a dissipation of the impact in the last three months. So in the, as I mentioned in the baseline scenario, global remittances uh, uh, would, would fall by around 57.6 uh, billion uh, in 2018 GDP uh, level and GDP prices. 58.6 uh, 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 the, the share of Asia uh, for, 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 for the fall is roughly around 31.4 billion, which is quite large. So as a proportion of GDP, the global impact is about 9.7% of baseline remittance, whereas for Asia, it's about 11.5%. And the main reason why there is a bigger impact in Asia is that uh, the share of Asia in the number of global migrants is actually quite large. If you look at within Asia, the biggest subregion affected by the COVID-19 in terms of remittance is actually South Asia. So more than half or 58% of the decline in Asia comes from South Asia, where remittances would fall by around 18.3 billion. The next one to follow is Southeast Asia, which accounts for around 19.7% of the fall in, in Asian remittance, uh, equivalent to $6.2 billion. Uh, and last but not the least, of course, uh, PRC also has a very big impact in terms of uh, the share uh, to in the decline of Asian remittance, which is around 11.1% of the Asia total or 3.5 billion. Now, if you look at where this uh, decline is coming from by source economy, the biggest source of the decline is actually remittances coming from Middle East. So of the Asia total, I think 53.7% uh, equivalent to 16.8 billion is actually coming from Middle East. The next most important uh, source uh, destination is actually the US, where which accounts for around 30% of the remittance decline in the region, equivalent to 8.8 .8 billion dollars. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if we rescale, uh, all those numbers are actually couched in terms of 2018 GDP and 2018 prices. If we rescale, the impact uh, for 2020 GDP and 2020 prices, uh, the global impact in the baseline scenario will be equivalent to 63.7 billion. Uh, and for Asia, it will be equivalent to 32.9 billion. Now, this shows you the impact uh, based on the worst case scenario or uh, the scenario where uh, it takes 12 months to control the pandemic and normalize the economic situation. And what you can see here is that the impact on global remittance is exceeds uh, 108 billion globally. Uh, this is equivalent to 18.3% of the 
2018 baseline remittance data. Uh, out of the 108 billion, half is uh, accounted for by decline in remittances going to Asia, which is equivalent to 54.2 billion. Uh, the regions that uh, are most affected are the same. It's basically South Asia, next is Southeast Asia, then PRC. Uh, if you look at where the decline in remittances are coming from, the major markets for Asia are Middle East, which accounts for 41% of the total decline, followed by the United States, which accounts for 38%, and then uh, Europe, U EU, and the United Kingdom accounts for around 6.3% of this decline. Next slide, please. What is interesting in this uh, analysis is that the impact of host economies on the region are quite varied. Uh, so if we look at, for example, the largest hit region of Southeast Asia, most of its impact are actually coming from uh, the decline in remittances from the Middle East. Uh, primarily in our modeling, uh, aside from the economic impact of COVID through decline in consumption, investment, tourism, and trade cost, we have incorporated an additional channel in terms of the oil price. In our modeling, what we've done is we've cut the uh, supply, uh, the production of oil by 20% in the baseline scenario, and uh, more than 45% in the worst case scenario. And this is the reason why you're seeing a very large impact coming from the Middle East. So for South Asia, 65.8% are accounted for uh, by the Middle East. Uh, it's interesting that for if you look at Southeast Asia and all the other regions, Southeast Asia, PRC, Pacific, uh, even East Asia, excluding PRC, the most dominant source of the decline in remittances are actually coming from the United States. Um, however, uh, the, I think among the ADB uh, subregions, uh, Central Asia actually is also being hit hard, and the story there is actually also the large decline in remittances coming from Russia, which is related to the weakness in uh, global oil prices. Next slide, please. Now, this graph shows you the country level impact, and what you can see from the country level impact is there is a wide range of uh, in terms of the COVID impact on remittances from 5.2%. Uh, of baseline remittance for Malaysia to as high as 28.7% of baseline remittances for Nepal. And if you look at the countries which are affected highly, these are actually uh, countries in South, uh, South Asia as well as in Central West Asia. The Philippines being highly dependent on remittance income are also uh, highly affected. Um, its remittances falls by around 20% uh, compared to the 2018 baseline. Next slide, please. Uh, comparing the ADB estimates with uh, the World Bank estimate, uh, which was released uh, last April, uh, our estimates are roughly very close. Um, it's roughly around uh, converging around uh, uh, 19 to 20% uh range if you look at the worst case scenario before i i close uh, although we estimated two scenario we feel that the window for the baseline scenario is actually fast closing because that scenario may be applicable to some countries who have quickly uh, controlled the pandemic and normalized their economic activities like thailand uh, vietnam taipei china hong kong however because we are seeing uh, a second wave is in many countries, including the Philippines and also Australia, we feel that the more realistic scenario in this analysis is really the worst case scenario. Back to you, Aiko. Thank you, James. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Maybe we're having some uh, issues. Uh, I would like to, yeah, uh, no, it's not this one. It's the one before, sorry. 
slide, slide number 11, please. So the um, suspension or the reduction on remittance can have a devastating effect on household in migrant house uh, in the migrant source country. This, sh this chart shows the share of a household receipt of a total household in the country reporting to have received the remittances in that given year. As shown here, the household in Tonga, Samoa uh, has high, very high uh, percentage of the share of recipient and also in the Fiji at 40%. Poor households with high dependency on remittance are at the most risks, so which is not represented here. For example, in the Kyrgyz Republic, the remittance constitute about 75% of the recipient household income on average. So not having that uh, income, suspension of the income can have a devastating effect. And the greater concern is uh, found among households of older person. In Philippines, for example, the prevalence of older citizens receiving overseas remittance is high as 21%. And moreover, over the past decade, there has been a relative ease of access to finance in paying for migration related cost. And this has created an increasing incident of overseas migration among poorer households in some countries. So these con these, uh, there are risks that these poor uh, poor household to start with may that are dependent on remittance may fall back on poverty. Uh, many of the existing uh, emergency social protection, however, are linked to employment, such as employment benefit and minimum wage guarantee. And these by design would not reach poor remittance recipient household. It's important that the household experiencing general income loss, including that from remittance source, are also covered in some of the measures uh, of the relief. And uh, well, although it's not the focus of our brief here, it's also important to mention that households receiving domestic remittance from their family members in lockdown cities confront similar challenges and deserve equivalent support. Next slide, please. So the COVID-19 on impact COVID-19 impact on international migration, if you look at uh, from the bigger bigger picture, we can say that it's likely to go beyond just the suspension of remittances or contraction of migrant job. In the medium to long run, the pandemic is likely to reshape a part of migration dynamics and governance, at least in four areas. The first is that the, even if when the demand for migrant worker may come back in some of the host countries, uh, there will be a greater restriction of movement with additional public health measures and possibly, possibly limited travel options. That leads to the second shift, which is a rise in the cost of migration, the add-on procedures and paperwork at administrative cost, and that some migrants may also have to pay for the possible loss or damage in case their migration ends up in a failure. It's also expected that a greater number of workers may look for overseas jobs as pandemic is continued to hurt major, uh, major source countries of migrant due to uh, insufficient or weak uh, health, health uh, mechanism to contain the pandemic at this point. In the meantime, the restriction and reduced clarity on migration procedure caused by frequent changes in the recruitment, and that that can uh, that can cause some uh, unclarity in that the recruitment process, and that can give rise to the informal and the irregular form of migration, such as human trafficking. So in this scenario, governments at both ends of migration needs to set a clear policy and guidance to respond to this sort of a new normal in administering, administering uh, cross-border movement. Next, please. So lastly, some notes on the policy recommendation. First, there, there are governments and host countries and origin countries of migrant have already introduced a number of measures, which uh, our panelists would uh, give us more example that in the coming uh, panel discussion and to support uh, affected migrants. The movement restriction, as but however, as the movement restriction and very weak labor market recovery persist, 
it's probably important for the effort to continue and expand as needed. The first area is to improve and continue to improve the safety and welfare of migrants and that family members back home. The recommendation recommended action here uh, consists of assisting uh, various type of migrants, such as stranded, laid off, or other district distressed migrants and provide necessary humanitarian, health, legal, and administrative support. Provide access among migrant workers to compensatory benefit and other emergency relief targeted COVID affected workers are important. In the source country of migrants, identifying and including poor remittance recipient family to connect them to emergency relief, such as cash transfer, is critical to prevent vulnerable household from falling back into poverty. The second area involves employment retention and placement of migrants. Host countries of migrants are encouraged to facilitate convenient and safe process of renewal of working permits, and also incentivize employers to retain workers, including migrants, and also facilitate re-employment and placement of laid off workers. Third, a more workers, as more workers return home, it's important for the source countries to ensure their employment, also skills training, as well as uh, fostering entrepreneurship among the returnees. Many, many of the migrant source countries have this such programs, such as reintegration center, and these can be expanded and enhanced to accommodate COVID affected workers. Fourth policy area is to ensure the flow of remittances by continuing to recognize remittance service as one of the essential service exempt during restriction. Uh, in addition, creating supportive business environment through measure such as giving a tax break, uh, relaxing some of the restriction and encourage them to reduce remittance with these measures are found effective in incentivizing uh, migrants to, to send remittances. In addition, there's a rapid expansion of digital platform in sending and receiving remittances. And this momentum can be captured to further promote the use and the availability. And next slide, please. And more information can be found on our uh, brief released yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aiko and uh, James, for a very um, uh, good uh, summary. Um, it's obvious COVID uh, not only impacted uh, international migration and remittances, uh, but also um, uh, generated enormous uh, negative consequences on recipient uh, households and the broad uh, uh, society. And um, for details of um, um, uh, ADB's analysis can be found, as um, uh, Aiko mentioned, uh, ADB brief, uh, which was published uh, yesterday. And also I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, this uh, brief was uh, jointly written by Aiko, James, as well as uh, Dr. Badri uh, Narayanan and also uh, Mr. Uh, Raymond uh, Gaspar. And uh, this, again, this policy brief is available from ADB website uh, for free. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, a panel discussion. Uh, it's our great pleasure today we have a group of uh, top experts on migration and remittance issues and uh, three experts uh, kindly uh, join uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, um, for our fellow uh, colleagues and uh, participants, if you have a question or comments, please use chat box for your questions, comments, and also clarifying questions uh, will be also appreciated. So now uh, let me uh, introduce our three panelists. Uh, first, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Nilim uh, Barua, um, uh, who is a senior labor migration specialist, ILO Regional Office, Bangkok. Uh, Mr. Barua uh, has been working on a migration issues since uh, 1998 and earlier in the development field. Uh, before assuming his current uh, responsibility as senior migration specialist at RAO uh, Regional Office for Asian Pacific in Bangkok in year 2011, uh, he was the uh, chief. Uh, uh, technical advisor of ILO Technical Cooperation Labor Migration Project in Southeast Asia um, for year 2010-2011 and uh, Eastern Europe Central Asia 2007-2010. Earlier, he headed IOM, uh, International Mig 
uh, International Organization for Migration, IM, IOM's uh, Labor Migration uh, uh, Unit in Geneva from year 2002 to 2007. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Barua, for your joining. Um, uh, also, we have um, uh, uh, Professor Avi Young, uh, Professor Ecom's Department and Director Ateneo Center for Ecom Research uh, and Development, Ateneo de Manila University. Uh, Arbin Young is a professor of Ateneo de Manila University, and also I said, as I said, uh, he's a director of Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development. He supervises and leads uh, various economic researches, and uh, with team of uh, senior uh, uh, fellows, uh, provides economic briefings to corporate as well as government clients. He edits and contributes to the uh, Ego uh, Watch column of the Philippine Daily Business Broadsheet. Uh, business monitor. Uh, Dr. Ang also uh, serves as a resource person on economic and uh, policy makers in conferences and on radio and television, locally and internationally. Uh, his research area uh, cover macroeconomics, labor and migration, urban rural development competitiveness and systems and uh, capacity improvement. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ang, uh, to join uh, today. And um, also, uh, we have um, uh, uh, Mr. Ismatrev, uh, Ismatro uh, Ubaidovic. Uh, uh, he is an associate professor uh, from uh, Tajik State University of Commerce. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ubaidovic is currently uh, uh, is, um, uh, associate professor of Tajik uh, State University of Commerce and also consultant at ADB's uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, he's working on uh, introducing international standard classification of occupation 08 in Tajikistan. And he was a uh, deputy team leader of uh, ADP's skill and employability enhancement project. Uh, Professor uh, Ubay Dobik uh, has also um, uh, has uh, more than 15 years of uh, practical consulting experience for various international organizations. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vaidovic, for joining today. Yes. So uh, with this introduction, I'd like to um, uh, invite the first uh, Mr. Barua for initial uh, uh, presentation and the initial intervention. And uh, please um, uh, use your um, uh, initial uh, time, uh, five to seven minutes for uh, presentation. Uh, so Mr. Barua, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh... Mr. Moderator, and uh, thank you for this uh, invitation. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, Mara, can we move to the next slide? Um, I already moved it, sir. It's on slide two already. Okay, it doesn't show. Uh, never mind. So um, I'll talk briefly about the impact of, on migrant workers in the ASEAN region and the responses uh, regarding the pandemic. Um, now, uh, just two things with regards to these slides. Uh, this slide, the migrant workers form an important part part of the workforce in, in many economies in the Asia, but also in the GCC where many Asian workers are uh, working, particularly from South Asia and also from the Philippines where uh, they comprise about 70% uh, of the workforce on average. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I suppose you are seeing the next slide. It's, it doesn't appear on my screen. Uh, nevertheless, the impact on of the pandemic on migrant workers. Uh, ILO has estimated the loss of working hours, translating to loss of uh, uh, jobs. And for the Asia Pacific in the second quarter, that was uh, a fall by 13.5% compared uh, to the last quarter of 2019. And in the Arab states, it was 13.2%. So the 13.5% equals uh, is equivalent to 
235 million full-time jobs. Now, there's an economic impact and there's also a health impact. And in this slide, I want to uh, highlight uh, two, two points. One is that the living conditions for many migrant workers do not favor social distancing. And we have seen in Singapore, the increase in cases related to migrant workers in dormitories. Uh, second is in terms of the relief measures, uh, in most countries, destination countries, migrant workers are not covered either in income support or in unemployment insurance. Next slide, please. Uh, the next couple of slides uh, show uh, data on returns. I won't go through them. Uh, just to say that countries of origin are organizing repatriation flights, but many migrant workers who want to return from the Middle East or in Southeast Asia are still not able to. And uh, in Southeast Asia, at least most migrant workers remain in the country of destination. Can we uh, move to the slide on, uh, on the ILO research experiences of ASEAN migrant workers during the pandemic? Uh, we have uh, conducted research uh, in the various migrant worker resource centers that we support in Southeast Asia. And uh, in this uh, research, we had uh, some uh, 309 migrant workers in countries of destination and countries of origin uh, interviewed, 70% uh, of whom were women, and this occurred during March, April 2020. Uh, some of the key uh, findings here is one on the uh, next slide, please. On the positive side, uh, most migrant workers were well informed about the prevention uh, and the symptoms of COVID-19. So the information dissemination often through informal channels was quite effective. Amongst the workers surveyed in the country of destination, most were still uh, employed, but of those unemployed, uh, none had any access to social security support. With regards to returnees in countries of origin, uh, one important finding is that, uh, and this was done, uh, this was, this uh, was investigate, investigated with, with respect to Myanmar only, that most migrant workers, 58% have a plan to re-migrate. Uh, can we move to the slides on the responses? Well, on this slide, uh, I want to highlight uh, the protocol for deployment in the new normal. I think this will be necessary for, for countries of origin and Indonesia has already taken a step uh, in this regard. Uh, with uh, very recently coming up with the protocol for deployment in the new normal. Uh, and the other point I'd like to highlight is, is the uh, consultation sharing of experience on repatriation in, in South Asia. Next slide, please. With regards to countries of destination, an important point is, is Singapore recognizing that its housing for migrant workers in dormitories uh, was, uh, did not, uh, was not up to the adequate level and they have now uh, made improvements and they have a major program planned to improve housing for migrant workers. Can we move to the next slide? Now, with regards to both countries of origin and destination, there has been an ASEAN labor ministers meeting. The vulnerability of migrant workers during the pandemic was uh, recognized. 
And we expect that uh, during the work plan of the ASEAN Committee for the Protection of Migrant Workers, uh, these issues will be taken up. Can we move to the last slide? Now, uh, in closing, uh, I want to uh, just make a couple of points in the time uh, available. One is that there is a need to address certain structural flaws in the labor migration system in Asia and in the Middle East. That is the current system of uh, relatively liberal entry uh, for workers in elementary occupations, which is good. It, it benefits workers, families. But it is also accompanied by restricted rights and temporary stay. Now, temporary stay is not going to change, but the restricted rights, when, when we go back beyond the pandemic, after the pandemic, we should not go back to business as usual. And there's a need to give attention to wages, uh, with, which are particularly low in, in some destination countries in Asia and the Middle East, and also to improve housing. And along with this, equal treatment with nationals and social protection. Now, we have seen during the pandemic, migrant workers have not been able to access uh, uh, relief measures such as income support in destination countries. And with regards to unemployment insurance, uh, that has taken place only in Thailand for uh, migrant workers in the so-called formal sector, but not in sectors such as uh, fishing and agriculture. Next is wage protection. We have seen that many migrant workers, particularly in the Middle East, have not been able to get the end of contract benefits. And there has also been a number of con complaints regarding wages not having been paid in full. So this needs to be addressed, including support services through trade unions and civil society organizations for migrant workers to avail of their entitlements. Um, finally, let me uh, talk a little bit about humane and health-focused treatment of undocumented migrant workers, because we have seen that in one country in Southeast Asia during the pandemic, there were some mass arrests of undocumented migrant workers, and they were put in unsafe conditions in detention centers and we should avoid these things during the pandemic and have a humane and health focused treatment of all workers. And this also has public health uh, implications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Nir Barua, for a very nice um, uh, presentation um, focusing on uh, ASEAN region. And also, uh, your last slide nicely summarizes. Uh, 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 recommendations and policy, uh, necessary policy options. And also, I, I really like uh, um, uh, uh, your presentation. Uh, you kindly share uh, very granular information from uh, 300 or so migrant interviews. That's very, very valuable. So now uh, let's um, uh, invite uh, Professor Albin Yang, uh, uh, who will present um, uh, more uh, closely uh, specific country case uh, from the Philippines. So, um, uh, Professor Ang, uh, please uh, uh, start your presentation. And again, uh, five to seven minutes uh, uh, for your presentation. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Yasu, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Aiko and James, for your presentation as well as uh, Nilim. Well, um, as you all know, the Philippines is one of the most uh, affected country in terms of international remittances, and. Uh, what I will uh, show you here is a <clears throat> is a chart of uh, of a graph or a picture of where most of the Philippine migrants are, and you know that they are the most uh, diverse or dispersed uh, country of uh, origin in in all over uh, the world. And there are about 4.8 million uh, migrants, permanent migrants, and there are also uh, 4.2 temporary migrants. And there are, of course, irregular migrants that are in more than 200 plus countries. And uh, this also includes uh, ocean flying uh, vessels. Um, <clears throat> the, cost, the Philippines uh, expanded the uh, dispersion of its migrants all over the world. However, it's not concentrated, uh, is, is largely concentrated in the Middle East, particularly 
uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE were about uh, 55% of the uh, migrant uh, workers are. And of course, uh, because of this uh, highly dispersed uh, uh, and then uh, expansion of Filipino workers abroad, uh, the uh, tendency is uh, Sorry, it's freezed. Okay. There are about uh, 100,000, more than 100,000 Filipinos, overseas Filipinos that have been already been repatriated because they were either affected by uh, uh, the crisis, uh, losing their jobs, and some of them are, have been uh, sick. So uh, the DFA actually estimates another 100,000 will be repatriated uh, in the coming days. Uh, this actually is very close to our estimate. And in early April, uh, while looking at the oil price uh, declines, uh, me and my colleague, uh, Jeremiah Opiniano uh, from the University of Adelaide, have looked at the impact of oil prices and uh, on the pandemic. And looking up just primarily at the Middle East, you can already see the possible uh, decline uh, that it will cost to remittances, uh, not looking even at the type of work that uh, the Filipinos are engaged because they are from the highly professional and uh, uh, managerial uh, work to elementary work. And so the impact is more or less going to be uh, affecting those who are in, unable to move out uh, and shift upskill or downskill in their uh, current work. And so as early as uh, April, we estimated probably about 20% of remittances will be lost this year, and about 300 to 400,000 uh, of them may probably lose uh, their jobs. Uh, of course, the macroeconomic implication of this would be staggering in the sense that uh, if you look at this uh, data, you would see that uh, this chart, you would see that um, uh, over the years, the remittances have been a stable source of uh, of uh, economic uh, push in the Philippines, uh, roughly uh, st stable at about 10% of GDP. Uh, and uh, if you look at the traditional sources of foreign exchange, like uh, particularly exports, and you have seen the significant decline from uh, mid-2000s and had not recovered up to today. But this slack has been pulled up uh, largely by, uh, by remittances and a little support uh, from the increasing receipts in tourism. And that allowed the Philippines uh, not too much uh, to uh, not go into the debt market. However, uh, with this uh, scenario that we are seeing, we are increasing, increasingly uh, observing that the Philippines is going back to the to the debt market and in possibly increasing the debt service as a percent of GDP in the coming years. Uh, as to the households, uh, I call also shared the implications to the households, um, and this is. Uh, I'm showing you a chart from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas uh, on the consumer expectation survey. And this, this is actually very consistent with many surveys that we have conducted on how the remittance uh, have been used in the Philippines. A large segment of it, of course, is its basic essential food and, and household needs. But a significant portion goes into education uh, and, and uh, payment of debts and uh, consumer durables. Uh, in our second policy brief we wrote in late May, uh, we actually warned that uh, there was a statement initially that uh, the remittances would, would be counter-cyclical, as I observed also. And she also said that it's not going to be the same because unlike the 2009 crisis, the dispersion of the Filipinos allowed the remittances to be continued to be increasing even in places, uh, in some places were experiencing declines. But in this case, this is a worldwide uh, condition that we are facing. So it is very unlikely that you can have a resilient uh, overseas uh, my, uh, international remittance to come in. Um, and uh, the, of course, the value chain of that is going to be significant because we know that it has been sustaining uh, household consumption uh, through education. And largely, in, in an earlier study, we have found out that uh, it, the remittances is early in the mid 2000s is causing housing booms, and of course it's also uh, boosting finance, malls, and urban developments across the country. 
And this study, uh, early this uh, July, uh, our uh, a, a research that we are working with uh, J our colleagues at JICA came up with a more detailed uh, household impact, estimating that the, the decline in remittances in households, not the macro, but household levels, could fall between 23 to 32 percent. So that's a, that's a large uh, con conversion into the household levels. Um, so, well, it's, it's, uh, we have uh, seen how the Philippine government had tried to address these challenges uh, and by uh, providing uh, some support, uh, bringing in home uh, workers through uh, uh, coordinated flights and, and uh, trying to bring them home into their home provinces as well. It's not an easy task, and if there are 100,000 more coming, that would be a, a challenge as well. Um, however, our, our, in our initial uh, policy brief that we wrote, we actually uh, called on the international uh, uh, organizations to, uh, since this is a, a global and, and, and a large-scale problem, it is possible right now to have a, an international uh, cooperation on this with I, I, IOM, ILO, ADB, probably can and come up with some sort of a, um, cooperation on how to address this challenge, which may, which may extend uh, over the next years. Um, also, there have already been existing uh, uh, agreements uh, on this, particularly in relation to, to the health of the migrant workers. Uh, Nilim uh, touched on that in his uh, last point as well. There's a uh, WHO Global Action Plan on Migrants and their health, so that could be something that can be revisited at this time. And uh, also, as Neelam pointed out, we are looking forward in November 2020 when we can also look at how the migrants uh, 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 in the next uh, uh, AFML meeting in November could look at how the ASEAN Consensus for Protection and Promotion of Rights of Migrant Workers and Families uh, can be utilized and invoked in this, uh, in this crisis. So uh, and with that, and I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Arbing, uh, for a very nice uh, uh, summary. Uh, uh, not to mention um, uh, Philippine OFW, overseas Philippine workers, are very important. So we can learn a lot from what has been happening on the OFWs and uh, what's the policy options uh, 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 undertaken. Um, uh, so we can learn from uh, Philippine case. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now uh, let's uh, shift the gear a little bit uh, to look into another region uh, seriously affected by COVID-19. Uh, that's um, uh, Central Asia. And um, uh, from uh, ICO's and uh, James' presentation initially, we see um, uh, really a substantial de decline of uh, remittance flow from uh, Russian Federation into this uh, Central Asian uh, subregion. So um, this is very important. Um, um, uh, we can have an insight from uh, 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 Professor Ubay Dobik uh, talking about uh, Tajikistan case. So again, um, uh, Professor, um, uh, please spend uh, five to seven minutes. And also for um, uh, participants, again, uh, please um, uh, put your uh, comments and questions in chat box. Okay, uh, over to you, uh, Professor Ubaidubai. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Director. Uh, special thanks for supporting and invitation to Ms. Aiko. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, I'm from Central Asia, particularly from Tajikistan. Tajikistan is one of the smallest country in Central Asia, and Central Asia includes five post-Soviet post -Soviet countries, post-Soviet Asian countries. But even some scientists hold the point that the area should cover more territory, like a part of Mongolia, Afghanistan, and the part of China. But five Post-Soviet countries is okay for me for today's presentation because if we are all post-Soviet countries, we have common trends in all uh, sphere, in particular in demographic policy and migration policy. In fact, we have a common uh, uh, direction, common trends in this area in the migration processes, first of all, because we all five Soviet, uh, post-Soviet uh, Central Asian countries have uh, one country of destination for migrants from Central Asia. It is the uh, Russian Federation and almost uh, 95 or 98 percentage of all migrants from Central Asia 
walk in the Russian Federation. Please, uh, next slide. I uh, please can you, uh, so okay. I will say about Tajikistan, but as I mentioned, uh, the problems are common for all Central Asian countries. Problems are similar. We have common trends in migration. So uh, the first issue in migration for Central Asian countries, in particular for Tajikistan, is a statistics. Uh, as you see from this uh, table, that is annual flow of Tajik migrants to Russian Federation. And in the last year before pandemic, the total number was more than 500,000. It's uh, from uh, based on official statistics from the government of Tajikistan, based on migration service under the Ministry of Labor, Migration and uh, Employment of the Republic of Tajikistan. <coughs> but another source says that the number of Tajik migrants in Russian Federation is more than 1 million and even 1 million 200,000. The Russian, uh, the Russia said, insist on this figure, on this data. But the Tajik side says that, sorry, you don't have to, re to register everybody who crossed the border. Uh, only 500 people are labor migrants in Tajikistan and you already deported 300,000. Please take off this number. So that is, uh, so two sources from Tajik government, more than 500,000 uh, migrants we have from another sources, we have around 1 million or more than 1 million migrants in Russian Federation. So uh, I don't talk too much about the, the statistics. I come to pandemic, please, in the next slide. So as for the pandemic in Central Asia area, situation is worse in Kyrgyz Republic, in Kyrgyzstan and, and, and Kazakhstan. And more better situation is more better in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So again, uh, as uh, when the pandemic started, of course, first of all in Russian Federation. Uh, uh, by the way, all Tajik migrants are seasonal migrants. They move to Russia. They walk a little bit, depending from the situation. They walk three months, five months, ten months. Uh, as they receive some, they make some money. They come back. They stay around three months, six months in Tajikistan, and they come back again to work in Russian Federation. So the pandemic is started in Russian Federation. So Russian Federation have announced a shutdown of the country and travel ban. What's happened? Migrants, a lot of uh, migrants were in lockdown. So who has been working in Russian Federation uh, stayed in Russia, who was at the time at the time of pandemic in Tajikistan. So they stayed in Tajikistan. They were unable to move again for migration to Russian Federation. So IOM in cooperation with the Ministry of Labor and Migration, migration has developed um, an action plan uh, addressing COVID-19 in Tajikistan. And again, <clears throat> based on the estimation of these two organizations and other international organization, NGOs working on migration. There is, of course, again, the issue of statistics, there is no, not clear number, but they said around 20, 25 percentage of Tajik migrants at that time stayed in Tajikistan and they are unable to move to Russian Federation. And around 75, 80 percentage of Tajik migrants uh, stayed in Russia. So, uh, but from <coughs> the sources, uh, the, based on the information from the uh, from the Tajik Embassy in Moscow, around uh, 10,000 migrants are registered uh, are registered in the embassy for with the, uh, with the intention to urgent uh, immediate return to the country. And the government started to organize charter flights, and already around 2,500 uh, migrants already returned. So in in so we have uh, as you see. The, the pandemic has changed the structure of migration for six months for the period of pandemic. A lot of migrants stayed in Russia. Uh, so please, if uh, to take a Tajik mi migrants, so if 80 percentage of Tajik migrants stayed in Russia, by the way, based on the information, more than 50 percentage of those works in construction. 
But even during the shutdown, the construction continue to walk. Around 50 percent of Tajik migrants continue to walk. Only a, a, a migrant who walked in other fields, for example, in trade, in services, it's around 16 percentage plus 11 percentage. Uh, so around 40 percentage uh, of migrants in Russian Federation, in fact, were in lock lockdown. They were not able to pay for living, for eating, and most of all, for sending remittances to the country. Uh, so the second issue is based on this one, as uh, as I mentioned, around 40 percentage, 30, 40 percentage were not able almost for the sending remittances to Tajikistan. It's happened declining, declining amount of remittances in Tajikistan uh, from migrant. So I we guess that we will feel the more negative impact of the pandemic and these processes a little bit later, starting from September, October, or November, because in September uh, the academic year will start and people have to pay for education. Mm, children of migrants as students of universities in Tajikistan and later the season of disease and cold will start and people will have, uh, will should pay for health care. Mm, so, uh, in, in addition, so, uh, uh, so I, uh, as I already mentioned in relation to the number of migrants, we already have officially 267,000 migrants who were deported from Russian Federation. They are, uh, uh, they are banned migrants in Tajikistan <coughs> and uh, in addition, we have around 100,000 uh, uh, migrants who were not able to move to Russian Federation and plus 3,000 migrants who already returned in the last two, three weeks. So it's from a, a, a target group of migrants inside of country. So next issue is uh, Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the next issue is the future implication of the impact of COVID-19 into migration and remittances in Tajikistan. As you see, uh, Ms. Eka already mentioned, uh, the amount of remittances in Central Asia uh, were reduced for around 2 billion, 2.228 billion dollar, and it's for the country where I live 72 million uh, population. So in the case of Tajikistan, as you see in the slide, uh, the, the amount of uh, remittances in 2018 and 2019, it was around 2.7 uh, 2 billion. Uh, but in the first half of 2020, we have received closely to 1 billion or 900 million. Uh, as you see, it's less for 30, 40 percentage. It's again, a part of migrants who was in lockdown, who was shut down, it's who worked on trade, who worked on services, who worked on tourism and other sectors, except besides of the people who worked in construction, who worked in construction sector, always were in lockdown in the countryside of Moscow or St. Petersburg, Petersburg, and they continue to walk. So <laughs> it means that um, uh, later, uh, the people will feel uh, problems related to the deficit of money for education, for health care, for nutrition and others. But uh, in general, if to see uh, to the future and to the future implication of the migrant and remittances in Central Asian countries, in particular Tajikistan, everything depends from the country of destination, from the situation in Russian Federation. The shutdown in Russian Federation has lasted four months. And in, in the beginning of August, the, the Russian Federation started to remove uh, restrictions to lift, sh shut down and lock down in the country. And it means that the people again started to walk. So the people uh, didn't walk for last four months. They didn't send remittances in the last four months. They have to walk three months more. They have to walk up to, uh, up to the end of the year and starting to the beginning of the next year, I guess that the situation will improve. They start to send again remittances. So the la next uh, last slide, please. So at the end of my presentation, uh, based on my private observation, 
can you move up, please? Uh, uh, I have some recommendations. Uh, uh, so as follows, that's the first issue, the uh, first thing that we have to do is to provide emergency assistance to vulnerable migrants in the countries of destination. And the second issue, uh, integrate migrants unable to migrate, pl migrate plus migrants reported, banned and returned. And of course, health and health assessment should be done because we don't we don't know how many migrants died from the pandemic and how many cases, how many positive cases of COVID-19 we have uh, among of migrants in the country or outside of the country and among of labor migrants. So and finally, encourage migrants and their families to use remittances more effectively, as mentioned in the presentation of Ms. Eko to involve more entrepreneurship uh, process and to, to teach them to, to start a business because business entrepreneurship is a, a job seeking process and job providing process first of all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again and sorry if I took too much time. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Baidubik, uh, for uh, providing us with uh, insights from uh, uh, Central Asia. So now we had uh, three um, uh, top experts, uh, very nice um, uh, presentation. Uh, so now uh, uh, we'd like to move to a uh, question uh, uh, Q&A uh, session. Uh, first, I'd like to ask each of the panelists a um, uh, broad question. Um, what's uh, what's the likely uh, uh, what what will likely happen in labor market uh, labor migration as well as a remittance in rest of uh, 2020 and also next year? Um, as we recall, I call under uh, James' uh, presentation, it will be based on the model uh, we set um, um, uh, a baseline scenario. 11.5% uh, decline in uh, remittance, and then a worst case uh, scenario uh, where uh, containment will take uh, one year, 19% um, or 20%, roughly 20% decline in remittance. So that's our baseline uh, or our uh, model based uh, assessment. Um, so the question is whether this is plausible. Uh, or what's overall impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, migration and remittance. Um, so some question is uh, whether we can envision V-shaped recovery uh, or um, alternatively uh, we should um, uh, uh, prepare for the scenario where COVID-19 will generate uh, a permanent impact and we will uh, enter new normal where uh, migration and remittance will permanently affect that uh, medium term, long term. And also, um, um, we have a few questions uh, from uh, Floa, uh, especially what's the likely uh, indirect impact on uh, poverty and broader uh, social uh, outcomes, uh, especially uh, uh, Kai from uh, Business Pointer uh, asked this question. And also Kijin asking about the difference between uh, Philippines and uh, Central Asia. Uh, uh, drawing upon experience of 2009 uh, global financial crisis. So, so that question can be also included uh, in um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ubay Dobik and uh, Mr. Ung. So um, anyway, uh, my uh, question, first question I'd like to ask is what's the likely impact on migration and remittance? So let me uh, start uh, from the um, uh, presentation order. So uh, Mr. Nilim Barua, can I ask you uh, to respond to this uh, broader question about likely impact, whether ADB estimate is underestimated or plausible? So pro please spend two or three minutes. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Oh, by the way, uh, all the panelists, uh, please turn on your uh, uh, camera so that we can have a, a panel session, virtual panel session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Barua. Over to you. Yeah. So if you look at the two main uh, destinations for Asian migrant workers, it is the GCC countries and uh, the ASEAN, where there's a lot of intra-regional migration. So uh, with regards to the GCC countries, the economies have been quite badly affected uh, because of the fall in uh, oil prices. We have reports of many migrant workers losing their jobs 
uh, wanting to come back, uh, but unable to come back because the re repatriation flights uh, uh, cannot be arranged altogether. And also, you know, they, they is, uh, uh, the normal flights are not, are not operating as usual. So the GCC definitely has been impacted. And so there will be a, a larger effect there with regards to fall in remittances of, as well as overseas employment. Now, when you look at the ASEAN countries, the main destination countries being Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, uh, you do see that most migrant workers are still in the destination country. Like uh, from my slides, you can see some tens of thousands returning from Thailand, but still bigger in Thailand, 2.7 million migrant workers. So majority are in the country. This is of course related uh, partly to the fact that uh, there are restrictions on movement at crossing border. But there will be jobs uh, which uh, nationals uh, do not want to do, the more difficult low paying jobs, and these relative labor shortages will continue and will need to be filled. Having said that, certain occupations related to tourism, uh, travel, hospitality have been uh, affected quite badly and migrant workers have lost uh, jobs there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Nirbarua. Um, so now, now I'd like to invite um, uh, 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 Professor Arvin Ang uh, for same question. What's the likely impact on um, uh, migration and uh, remittance and whether ADB is too optimistic or plausible? And also if you can touch upon impact of poverty or broader social impact, although one of your slides are talking about the household impact, and um, uh, lastly, uh, Kijin Kim uh, uh, from ADB asked a mm. question about what's the difference between uh, Southeast Asia and uh, uh, Central Asia uh, mm. during the uh, global financial crisis uh, on the impact of uh, uh, re uh, remittance and uh, uh, migration. So if you if you kindly spend the two, three minutes <laughs> answering okay. uh, multiple <laughs> your questions. OK, Over I, to I, you. I, thank you. I'll try uh, Yasu. Well, actually, uh, like what Nilim said, uh, we are looking at the GCC countries as uh, you know the major uh, uh, determinant of uh, the remittances, uh, international remittances, and uh, and as we see that many of these countries where the concentration of workers are uh, most likely uh, will not uh, really recover immediately this year because even if, as uh, oil prices have started to increase, that the demand is still low. And so, most likely, many many uh, workers will still have uh, will not have jobs at, uh, in, in those destination countries. Um, most uh, and as as uh, Nilim also mentioned, uh, these are in the areas of hospitality and mostly services, uh, elementary services as well. And so, uh, this is where uh, we really have to prepare because a lot of the workers that uh, have left from the Philippines. Uh, in the last maybe 10 years are mostly in the lower income, lower uh, skill type of work at, that needs a lot of protection. So this is uh, uh, also going to impact as many of them are the ones being sent home because they can either upskill or de-skill. And this is related to the 2009 uh, observation wherein the wide dispersion of Philippine workers allowed them to move uh, uh, to places where the, the, the impact, global uh, financial crisis impact was not uh, uh, the same in any many countries. So even um, in within the GCC countries, uh, some did not experience as bad as du uh, UAE and Dubai, for example. So people just move to other uh, GCC countries, and they can use the they can either de-skill or upskill. So for example, some Filipino engineers de-skilled by becoming electricians because they know the basics. So these are uh, uh, adjustment plus Besides, the borders were not closed, unlike today. So the, the challenge is that uh, this uh, current one is not comparable to 2009 and uh, the impact is most likely going to be uh, not going to go away that quickly. And so uh, a 20 percent decline as, uh, percent, as shown by uh, the simulation of the ADB study, I think is, is uh, most likely. And uh, unless there is, a, as I was calling for an international cooperation of how to address this, uh, 
it, it, it most likely will uh, continue the next year. Th thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Ong. Uh, uh, Professor Ubay Dobik, uh, would you like to respond? Uh, what's the likely uh, scenario for uh, Central Asia on migration and remittances? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as can, can, you, already... can you kindly turn on your um, uh, video, if uh, possible, video camera? It's on. Oh, is that on? It's, okay. It's on. Okay, okay. I don't know. It's on. From my side, it's on. It's okay. Over to you. Uh, no. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much again uh, for the question and uh, in relation to the impact of the COVID-19 into the migration process, as uh, I already mentioned in general in my presentation, uh, I, have, I had a separate uh, slide about it. Uh, we have to mention three things. The first thing is that under the pandemic situation, and travel ban, some migrants uh, uh, stayed in Russian Federation, uh, they are in lockdown, and some migrants are not able to move to Russian Federation. So in relation to these two categories, new category of migrants, uh, of course, we have to protect their rights in Russian Federation. We have to organize uh, vocational trainings, soft trainings, and different types of employment, uh, uh, empl employment enhancement for Tajik migrants were not able to move to the Russian Federation. The second issue is uh, declining of remittances that, of course, will negatively impact in general on social life of the Tajik population in the next months. Because if even the travel ban and uh, shutdown will be lifted in the next months, uh, the migrants will not send remittances on the next months because they have to work six months, five months, uh, eight more, ten months to save money and then to send. It's it's uh, clear that uh, this declining of remittances will continue. In the next months it will take a negative effect in the social life in general. But one another issue based on the official statistics in relation to uh, labor market in Central Asia uh, region. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we have official statistics. Uh, I don't know how do we trust the official statistics because uh, it says the number of unemployed registered, registered and un unemployed person is in Tajikistan around 2.7 percentage, in Uzbekistan around 8 and 9 percentage. It's official statistics. They say registered unemployed. Uh, so, so uh, even uh, official statistics says they make some prognosis that in Tajikistan this percentage will increase and already increased from 2.7 uh, to from 2.7 to 7 percentage, and in Uzbekistan from 9 percentage to 12, 13 percentage. It's just uh, for comparison. It's a, a bad situation on uh, labor market in Central Asian countries in the case of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So thank you very much. Th thank you, thank you very much. So now uh, I'd like to slightly switch gear to talk about the role of the government in managing COVID-19 impact on migration <coughs> and remittances. Um, what's the role of a uh, host country, uh, uh, sorry, source country as well as uh, uh, host countries? Um, although all the panelists already talk about the uh, government's role and policy uh, issues, but I'd like to also um, uh, invite uh, each panelist to recap the points. And also, if you have uh, already observed some uh, good practices and lessons, uh, please share. And also, there is a, a question from the uh, floor. Uh, destination country uh, like in the US, Russia, and Middle East, uh, what's the program already uh, uh, implemented uh, to protect the migrants? So there are specific questions. Uh, so if you can respond to this. But in any case, uh, uh, please um, uh, spend um, uh, two, three minutes. Uh, it, uh, actually, this will be a fi final round, but two, three minutes uh, to talk about the uh, critical role of the government uh, in managing uh, impact. So now, now let, let me uh, start uh, again uh, the order, following the order of presentation. So, uh, Mr. Nir Barua, can you spend a couple, two, three minutes uh, to respond to this question? Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, so, with regards to countries of origin, as I mentioned earlier, 
Uh, they will need to develop protocols or guidelines with regards to uh, deployment in the new normal until the pandemic is over, because there will be public health aspects which will come into recruitment and deployment, such as testing, quarantine in destination countries. So the question comes up, who is going to pay for this? Uh, as per the ILO fair recruitment principles and guidelines, these costs should not be passed on to the worker. So uh, protocols and guidelines for deployment in the new normal, uh, they will, uh, you, you have seen already in Thailand, Thailand has announced that it will be recruiting migrants. It will be opening up its borders for migrant workers. So uh, protocols and guidelines have to be developed uh, for this. And uh, then, as I mentioned also, uh, we need to look at certain structural issues. Uh, housing, the housing of uh, migrant workers when they're in communal housing or dormitories. They should uh, meet the adequate standards and there's an ILO recommendation on this recommendation 115 on housing. Uh, similarly on wages, like wages should not be left complete to the market. It, they should be an administrative minimum wage or they should be robust uh, social dialogue, uh, freedom of associ association and collective bargaining so that fair wages are paid to workers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ba uh, Baruang. Uh, uh, Professor Ang, uh, would you like to respond in two, three minutes about the role of the government? Yes. Uh, well, I, uh, as you have uh, noticed here in the Philippines, the government's role is uh, very proactive in the sense that uh, to the best that they can, they try to repatriate those that need to be repatriated and uh, try to provide them with some uh, income support. Even those who are uh, not repatriated but lost their jobs were given uh, uh, income support through their uh, OA system. Uh, however, uh, we know that this is not enough because uh, you can only give one or two times uh, support, but uh, this is an on ongoing and continuing crisis. And so that's why uh, our view is that uh, the, the Philippine government cannot do it alone. They have to negotiate with the uh, destination countries. Uh, whatever, uh, w w If uh, there are uh, still a lot of workers there that can be uh, especially those that are recovering right now, that are fastly uh, countries that are recovering, where that uh, if it's possible, don't send back the workers yet, uh, retool them, find ways and opportunities that uh, they can uh, 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 work still in, in, in the destination country. And of course, uh, this is a huge bilateral uh, initiative that has to be done by the Philippines with a lot of uh, destination countries that they are uh, uh, concentrated in. Uh, all, but uh, still, like what I uh, was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, many things uh, need to be done in a, an international coordinated manner in this because a lot of uh, workers are going to be affected, not only the Filipinos, but uh, all over the world. So it is, is it, if it is possible, uh, a, a, a multilateral approach to this uh, uh, challenge must uh, be initiated soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ang. Uh, Professor Ismatrev uh, Vaidovic, uh, would you like to um, spend uh, two, two, three minutes talking about uh, policy, role of policy and managing uh, COVID-19? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Director. So in relation to the contribution of the government uh, addressing uh, COVID and the impact of COVID-19, so I have to mention that uh, the, uh, the government or the Minister of Labor and Migration uh, closely cooperates with international organization, in particular with international organization for uh, migration. They have in initiated a joint working group uh, comprising all international organization working in Dushanbe, chairing by the way by Madam Minister. This working group uh, has developed an action plan for pandemic period, for the period of pandemic, and uh, based on this uh, action plan, uh, they start to work to protect uh, some rights of Tajik migrants in the Russian Federation through associations and NGOs 
national NGOs, Tajik NGOs who works on protection of rights of migrants in Russian Federation. Uh, so uh, based on the information around 5,000 Tajik, vulnerable Tajik migrants in Russian Federation already received some assistance. And uh, in relation to travel ban, the government in cooperation with the air companies of Russian Federation organizes per two, three charter flights every day and they start to, to return migrants who stayed in Russian Federation. So, in fact, the main uh, positive fact, in my opinion, in good cooperation of Ministry of uh, Migration, Ministry of Labor and Migration with international organization, with particular with international organization of uh, migration and uh, establishing this working group, joint working group, uh, chaired by the Madam Minister of Labor, Migration and Employment of the Republic of Tajikistan. Uh, so, of course, in general, we have special uh, we have, uh, coordinating center within the government that coordinates all issues related to, to pandemic situation. For example, they will say when will be started academic year in the countries, when uh, the flights, uh, the, the, uh, the travel ban uh, be lifted in general. It's uh, more central coordination. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, it, it, it's great to know that um, uh, many governments, uh, both on um, uh, source country and uh, host side, uh, started doing uh, many uh, uh, interventions and programs to protect uh, migrant workers. Uh, but um, um, uh, still, the uh, situation is uh, fluid and uh, 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 seeing uh, some uh, sign of uh, recurrence in some countries, um, um, uh, COVID crisis is still ongoing. So I think uh, many more things to be done. And uh, we learn a lot uh, from the ASEAN experience, uh, Philippine and South Asian experience. So we had a very, very good um, uh, discussion today, lively and good discussion today to broaden our scope on impact of uh, COVID-19, as well as uh, uh, critical role policy in managing uh, crisis. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, close uh, today's uh, webinar. And uh, uh, please uh, join me to thank uh, three uh, really uh, excellent, uh, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, panelists. Uh, Mr. Nir Barua from ILO, uh, Mr. Arbin uh, Ang, uh, Professor Arbin Ang, and also uh, Professor Ismatro F. Uh, Ismatro Ubaidubik. Thank you. Thank you very much. And join me to thank uh, these panelists. And also, I uh, call James and uh, ADB staff member and colleague who kindly attended uh, today's webinar. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks to you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Masarap, masarap ma. Marubusoni Sandro yun.